Bet three, two, one. My ducks, my swans, welcome to the pond. Just 82 points of view with Dorian. I'm your host, Dorian. We got two very special guests here today. Um, like you guys always know, like I try to bring people on who I've been inspired by in some capacity. And we usually meet through social media or I knew them and in person or something. And the first person I'm going to introduce, like she's been engaging with my content for a while. She would always give really, really insightful comments. She even called in on some of my IG lives. And like the last time she called in, she was really hidden. Like, the, the, I think we talked about like uh, black business owners and stuff like that. I was like, yo, we really got to get her on the on the podcast. So I started investigating and looking and seeing what she had done. And she's done a lot of good stuff in, in the music industry. So I knew she would be a person that we could definitely have on here and, and really introduce herself and you guys can get to know her. So our first guest is Miss Melissa B. How are you? Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> Boy, good. And for those of you that are watching, we have someone else that's on the screen. So when I was talking to Melissa and I was telling her, I was like, hey, I know you've been on the billboard. Um, I think it's something that, that we're probably going to talk about. She's like, well, I might have a surprise for you. And like when people say it, I'm like, the fuck she talking about? So, so <laughs> she said, like, well, I might have a friend that could actually help. So I'm like, all right, cool. So then she sent it over. And um, this this person has been in the music industry for a while. Um, he has a song that's on the billboard right now. So this is somebody that can actually help artists too. So Mr. Michael DeBarge, how are you? Hey, what's going on? How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. Look, so, I feel weird. <laughs> Michael, for those that are watching, Michael is on his phone, so he can't see. You know what I mean? So it's a straight audio for him. Um, but the first question that we ask everybody is, what is the worst job you've ever had? It can be like anything. Regular job? But, yeah. Any, worst, any job, anything. Any fast food, retail, when any. What's the worst job that you ever had? I think. Oh, you know, when I was a teenager, I, I worked at a uh, a retail store for kitchen utensils. I hated it. What the hell? What? You, so you sold forks and spoons? Yeah. <laughs> was it like a boutique or was it like a chain? Like. Yeah, it was a boutique or something. It, it, I was young. It was in Virginia. <laughs> So you had a lot of geriatric clients coming in there. Uh, like, oh. I went the I literally lasted for two weeks and I said, I'll never do this job ever again. I told my parents, don't you ever tell me to try to go get a job. I will never do real chill. This is not my thing. Man, hell no. Nah. Selling spoons, butter knives all day. Nah. Kitchen stuff. I was like, I would, I don't know. I just felt so I was like, I this is I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think we've all been there with that. Michael, how about you? I never had a really bad job, but I have a couple that are embarrassing. So I'll throw those at you. <laughs> so um, when I was when I was younger, and I wanted to keep buying equipment, and I, I you know I was like investing in crazy stuff and having it blow up my face. I would hustle on the weekends doing dance jobs, working at parties like bar mitzvahs and shit. So. Uh, you know, you'd be at little Jimmy's bar mitzvah clapping your hands. I was one of those people. And I, I did it a lot. Like, it made good money. But you're tired. You're embarrassed. And you end up bumping into people that you know. And they're thinking that something went wrong with you. <laughs> and then uh, the other one that I have, which is, it wasn't a bad job. And I actually had fun with it. But it's a terrible job to talk about nowadays. I used to be part of the security detail for Donald Trump. Oh, wow. How old were you? Are you serious? This was this was recently. Like I, I had a job. The last time I was working was uh, the last time I had nine to five was two thousand fifteen. Oh my gosh! Had he and announced that, that he was running for president yet? No, no, he wasn't even thinking about it at the time. But um, he was really cool to work with. It's just that he was, <laughs> and he wasn't. As, it's hard to say because he was really like he was actually a really good boss back then. It's just you know. Oh wow! But. Yeah, that was something that I did, and I, I don't talk about it much, but I had to deal with him, Bloomberg, Bill Gates, people like that. And I, I would like high profile. Yeah, uh, it was weird. It was it was a really strange thing. It's so it's interesting. Something I just learned. <laughs> but you know what it was? It was that I had already interacted with so many people on that level, so it was easy to throw me in there, and mm -hmm. I would just be the guy talking because I'm not like a big buff dude. But um, you know, I had the little keys and I could walk through all the New York City and go through the passageways and open the doors and let them in and bring them here, bring them there. And that oh, was what I did. Wow. Mouthpiece. It's so interesting that you say you were for him in 2015 and he hadn't thought about running for president. Then a year later, his ass in the White House. 
I wasn't there 24 seven whatsoever. So okay. I mean, that been going on, I had no idea, but it, yeah. I mean, it doesn't look like he's thinking much to begin with. So <laughs> I, it, it could have been something he was just toying around with, but, uh, I think when uh, he was having his little issues with Obama dissing the hell out of him all the time, I'm sure yeah. he wanted to run then, but it, it, there was no campaign going on when I was around. I was working in his office, like in the wow. actual Trump Tower across from Sony, which was funny because I was running three labels at Sony. So That's amazing, man. Back and forth. Yeah, things you do for insurance. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so, the, so the benefits were good? Hell yeah. <laughs> of course they were. I got paid to do nothing. Like, let's be serious. It was it was a gravy train. Yeah, I had nice little suits and everything. It was, it was cool. Yep, yep. So that's cool. Perfect, perfect. So Melissa, so both of you are from the East Coast, if I assume right. Well, mine is a little bit different now. I, yes, I come from the East Coast, but I did. I grew up everywhere. So my parents were in the military. So I grew up in Japan and Germany most of my life. And then uh, my parents re um, retired in Virginia. I lived in Hawaii too, and then then they retired in Virginia. What? So, what branch? Air Force, both of them. My dad was in the Air Force. I lived in Japan. Were y'all on Yokota Air Force Base? On Okinawa? Yeah, yeah. That's I where think I live. So my brother and my sister were born there. They're lucky, man. I, I lived there from um eighty five <laughs> to eighty nine. That's when well, I was she's there. Just finding this out. She's next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just half Japanese and grew up in Japan. So. Wow. <laughs> but she grew up in Okinawa. That's where she's from. So she's and just, like, her head just popped up. She's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't um I don't remember much from back then, but I, I, I do remember this is like before MTV and all, or it was starting up. Yeah. So they never, saw, they never saw black people ever. So whenever I went out, I was like a damn celebrity. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I was music video so when I was younger. I had a modeling contract. I didn't know all this shit till I got older. I'm like, yo, why my parents cash out? So I don't know if you had the same experience or, but <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So Michael, where are you from originally? See, that one, it, again, it's like, Melissa, I'm really from, I was in, in Jersey and New York City, my whole, like, pretty much my whole life in my mind. But for most of my childhood, I was working. So I would end up going out, um, they have a thing called pilot season in LA. And you pretty much live there in, like, these little apartments and stuff. And you, I don't know how to explain it. You're basically, like, herded cattle as children. And you go on auditions all day until you land something. If you don't land something, you got to go back home. And fortunate for me, I would land stuff and I would just travel around. And when I was younger, my main thing was I was a dancer. Like I was, I was one of those, if you ever see the show Dance Moms, I grew up like that. And I was traveling around a lot. So like my home base always seemed to be New Jersey or, you know, LA. Mm -hmm. But I really, in my mind, I'm really from Jersey. So were you doing like dance competitions? Was it auditions? Like, Everything. how was it? Everything. I was, um, <sighs> I, it was it was the competitions, but I was the you know you get boy points and stuff you know just for showing up and I was uh, you know to hold the titles and you travel around from place to place to place to place so it wasn't just competitions but I was one of the Star Search dancers growing up and oh, wow. I was doing commercials and I was doing dance instructional videos and music videos and little spots in movies and things like that so it just uh, I don't know it was it's like it's like a blur to me now but it was like <laughs> a lot of running around. Melissa, you um, when when you were younger, obviously, because you're a songstress and that yeah. babies come out the womb singing. Like, was there a moment in your life that your parents or the people around you pointed to when you were like two, three, four years old, where they knew that you were going to do music when you got older? Oh, no. I, when I was five years old, I came up, I walked up to my parents and I told them I'm going to be a famous singer one day. And I told my mom and my dad that I wanted to be um, on Broadway. And my dad and my mom were like, yeah, that's nice. And I'm like, no, no. I'm, at five years, I'm like, no, I'm serious. I'm going to be a singer. Like, this is, I'm destined for this. How did I know that at five years old? I don't know. I was the same way at like four. That's what I was, it's I remember weird. walking up and, and going, and I would look at the names on the credits of the albums. And I would Me too. Like, yeah. And I would be like, I'm going to have this. I want to be this. That's so weird. When I yeah. was, uh, the same thing Michael's saying, I used to do that too. I don't know why, like, my mom and my dad, like, they would, like, have so many albums. And as a child, I would sit there and read who producers were, who songwriters were. Why are a little kid going to be looking at stuff like that? Sometimes kids are like, oh, I just want to listen to the music, right? No. 
I wanted to go further. <laughs> I think when you're a creative, like children are just so creative. Like they could, because when you create, you have to not give a fuck. And kids are the ultimate, like not giving a fuck. And so when you are a natural creator, like you just kind of keep that. So when you create, when you get older, you like keep that childhood just this, I don't really care. So when, when you're younger, you probably have that intuitive feeling. And then something happened in your life where you were able to just keep it throughout. At least that's my personal opinion when it when it comes to creation, that if you don't keep that child like I'm going to ride with this, mm-hmm. it can it can really convolute. And I think that's where like the writer's block and all the other stuff comes in, too. Yeah. Michael, what do you think? I, I didn't even grow up. I have a hard time believing that I'm the age I am. <laughs> <laughs> have, have we seen your, are you missing your childhood? I don't, you know, I don't think it's that. I think a lot of people assume it's that. I think what it more so is, is that it's like an arrested development in a different way. Mm. I understood, I understood how to write a check by the time I was like seven. I understood how to balance a bank account at that age. And I was taught very early to be able to manage it. So for me, the things that we do as adults, I've had an understanding of it since I was so small that I don't feel like anything changed. I just, I got different jobs or, you know, like I, like in my head, I still feel like I'm 18 or 21 and then I get to move and I'm like, ah, oh, my knees, fuck it. But <laughs> other than that, I, I really, nothing's changed. I'm, I literally have had this, the same for the most part, the same major source of income, like my main source of income rather, has been the same since I was like 17, 18 years old. You know, so I never had to grow up. I didn't have to change. As long as I wasn't a jerk, it was okay. Now but, um, you now you saying now did you did you have you invested money so that your money can keep continuously grow for you? Look at the face. Yeah. Like, I gotta get to that <laughs> point because you just don't say you got money just still coming along because some people don't know that. That you've oh, invested I, I since you were little. Oh, no, no, no. You know what I did? I was smart. I forced myself to understand publishing because I got jerked a couple times. And I always tell people to get over it because rape isn't rape if it's consensual. You know what I'm saying? So, like, it's just a harsh way to put it. But <laughs> I signed the contract. Did I get what I signed up for? Yes. And did I get a shitty deal? Yes. But was it shitty at the time? No, it wasn't shitty at the time. And you can correct those things. You can always go back and correct them. Like there's laws that after like a 20 to 25 years, you can null and void any writing contract. So you have the ability to double your royalties if you have the right lawyer and you know what you're talking about and you have your original contracts and you're organized. So I stayed organized and I started buying back a lot of my stuff. I started buying back all sorts of things. So my um, main source of income comes from owning publishing estates. So I run 17 publishing estates and I keep collecting, collecting, collecting. Like I'm buying just a few weeks ago, I started buying into uh, Billy Idol's catalog. Like I own pieces of White Wedding. You know, I, I bought into Walk the Line, you know, um, by uh, Johnny Cash. So I'm getting things that seem valuable and seem like they're worth something. And then I can use that as collateral. I can either sell my shares to a bank or I can use whatever I earn from it instead of spending it. I will take it and I can invest it in my stock portfolios. But I'm saying a lot of it's it's stocks. And right now the market's trash. So yeah. Um, it kind of goes back to the topic of what we're supposed to be talking about. My hustle, my hustle way of bringing in income is not just being a record producer or working on TV shows or whatever. I still do that stuff to scratch that itch, but I don't like being up front, which is why I probably look awkward on this camera right now. <laughs> but um, it's working behind the scenes and developing mm-hmm. artists and, and working as a radio promoter and focusing on keeping those relationships. And it kind of ties into billboard that's really a big part of my income is yeah. getting people and breaking their records so uh you have to have a hustle you have to have your little geese that lay golden eggs and you got to do whatever you got to do to not cut the geese's head off you know and from there you invest in whatever you can properties like uh you know i have a, a situation with um david ruffin jr actually where we uh david actually owns a car lot and i will throw him money here and there and he will use that to buy cars at auction he fixes the cars he sells the cars i'm actually trying to get him to send me one right now so um so i always got into different things i bought into restaurants i hated it you know um got out of that so i realized that stocks you're publishing and then fixing other people's careers has been like my calling so uh it's still like a nine to five type job which is why i look like this i've been working all day 
I'm still drinking coffee because I'm tired. And uh, I don't know. That's it. I don't even know how to answer that question. You have to hustle. But it's, do the music does does the music still make money? Yeah. But does it really make a ton of money? No. You know, it's kind of like LeBron James. LeBron James probably makes 400 million or more from basketball, but he's pulling in over a billion with all of his investments and endorsements and so on. So I use musical music as a a way to bring some sort of popularity and some clout mm-hmm. so that my brand looks more effective. Because if I'm only behind the scenes, then people can't really tell what I do and they get confused. And I don't want to tell all my secrets. So um, it's, it's a combination of different things. And you put them all together and everything you do has to lead to the one goal, which is, you know, your financial freedom and sustaining your lifestyle. And I think that that's something that Dorian, that I think a lot of artists don't realize, especially in this industry now, because everybody wants that quick satisfaction of hitting something somewhere. And, yes. and Michael's been, <laughs> Michael's been in this industry and I've been in this industry for a long time and it's not that. And I think they lose sight of that because what happens if you do hit billboard? What happens if you, you hit it? Yeah. Then what is you your know- plan? you know, to be stable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You think about like, cause some people are so like, I'm going to hit billboard and you know, and then I'm going to do this and that. And I'm like, okay, do y'all think about the long term? Yeah. Because you want to, you want to, you want to be in this industry for a long time. You're not just going in here for just to be a one hit wonder. And, and even if wonder, that's, that's a scary slippery slope because, um, I say this a lot. I hate to sound like a broken record, but once you acquire fame, you can't give it back. Yep. You can only become infamous. And there's nothing more pathetic and sad than a broke celebrity. Because then all of a sudden yes. it's going to be like, yeah, like you're going to see somebody sitting there. Like like what happened to, you know, dude from the Cosby show and he was working at Trader, Trader Joe's. There's nothing to, nothing to laugh at. But it is hard. And it's embarrassing if you're in a situation like that and people see you and they go, Oh, what happened? That's their first thought. Not, oh, wow, you made enough money where you're saving your money and you're going to work every day so you don't spend it so that you're going to be super wealthy. That's smart. People don't see it that way. So if you don't have a really good plan, you end up as a one-hit wonder and you end up all screwed up. And there's a lot of one-hit wonders. And they were, a lot of people aren't really one-hit wonders. They just have a mega hit that supersedes the original thing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of those people, I kind of... I love them. I like to go and reinvigorate their careers and get them going. Like one of them that did really well was Skilo, the guy that had I Wish I Was a Little Bit Taller. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was one of my biggest clients for years. I have a new project coming out with him in just a, a little while where Melissa actually produced one of the records. But it took us, it took me like four years to get things up and running with him. And we were able to correct everything. We were able to get him control of all of his original masters. We were able to get him to you know be able to you know sue the label which they sold quick and get his back royalties license and stuff for tv shows we got him a freaking super bowl commercial from the work that we did but it took a long time and the thing that was great about him is that he understood the concept of if you don't invest in you nobody else will so we were matching every time i did something then he was coming to the table and he was matching it and he was working he was working a nine-to-five job and now he doesn't need to. I, I'm pretty certain he does have a nine to five, but he doesn't need it. Like I know for a fact, the guy's probably pulling in almost thirty thousand dollars a month just from Spotify alone. He yes. Really need to that point, but he's still point. ranking it in. Oh yeah, but it, the difference was now he has control of it. Before he'd have to chase people, so it was, you know, evolving. It's not just about being in front. It's not just about. Um, being popular, because what does that do for you? Like, what are you going to do? Like, oh, I'm the man. Everyone's looking at me. It, it, that doesn't convert to cash. Like, what does it do? It, it, it gets you invited to parties and maybe get your dick sucked, but that's not really going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> but nah. that's not going to... Keep that energy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm real, man. But that's, that's not going to sustain you for life. What's more important is, can you stay home? Can you focus on your paperwork? And can you make sure that no one's double dipping and triple dipping and people aren't cooking the books on you and, and we're able to correct it. It took like, you know, he was, he was hurting for maybe like 20 years, but it made a huge difference. And now no one can touch the guy. Like the guy is yeah. completely in control of everything, which is, that's the goal. That's you know, an that's amazing story. 
Good. think a lot of people too, like there's this big thing going around right now, like with Megan Thee Stallion. I know she talked about her stuff and Tory Lanez. He just got free, freed. He just got, he just uh, fulfilled his contract. Um, for artists, so we got a lot of independent artists in our audience, yeah. and a lot of them want to get signed. I don't, but a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. For those that get signed and have very minimal leverage, what can they do to make sure that their contract and their paperwork doesn't completely fuck them like some of the people that you've worked with before? Hire me and Melissa. Huh? You said hire an ambulance? Yes, hire, <laughs> hire, hire us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Seriously, seriously, like, you know, you would be amazed the people that you don't realize that are actually like making a difference. Like, for example, Melissa doesn't even know this. This was happening earlier today. And um, I'm probably stealing her thunder by saying it. But like Natalis, Natalis keeps getting called by Spotify to do consulting for them. Nobody would know the bars that we work with. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm like talking. like He doesn't know who she is. Yeah, but. Now this is a good friend of mine. She's uh, she's got two Grammy nominations. You know that's now this is actually how me and Melissa got connected, which is yes. funny. And um, yeah, it's a it's a you know, you know she's she's a really hardworking person that works in the background, and she does features where she's in the front. But the her bread and butter comes from songwriting, and she's written and, and done vocal arrangements for all sorts of people, whatever. She's got a couple platinum records over throughout the, you know, um, throughout Europe and, and Asia. Yep. And um, she does, she hustles, you know, she's always working on someone else's project all the time. And she's getting so much action that companies like Spotify are reaching out to her going, okay, everything is looking really good. I, and we love your presentation. How are you doing this? How could we be better? So she's, if they're companies that we all need to support us are coming to like people who are within our circle for opinions on how to be better, then you know that you're doing something. And it all kind of comes down to, you know, if they want to get signed or if they're if they're looking to get out there, the truth is they don't need it. I think that what you would need to do first before that is understand the steps. So it's like um, a lot of artists will complain about, um, and guys, cut me off if I'm going off too long, but a lot of artists will complain about, oh, I need a manager and then I'll get here. Mm-hmm. Or, oh, I need to have this hit on the radio and then I'll get there. Absolutely and that's not. not how it works. What happens is you're supposed to figure out a game plan for yourself and execute it. And when you get so busy that you can't possibly respond yep. to everybody fast yep. enough, that's when you hire someone to manage your business. It's like if you opened a bodega. If the bodega is a tiny little corner store, you can run it and then you just hire a clerk. That's an assistant. All right. If it gets to the point where you're working too many hours and you have to stay open 24 hours, then you hire a night manager and then you expand and then you Mm -hmm. expand from there. So artists that are trying to jump into a label and they want to not be in the Tory Lane situation or Megan Thee Stallion, the key to that is get your profile flawlessly executed first. So it's not just the front where, you know, you look great and you got great pictures and all that stuff. That's great. That's cute. But the back door should be your publishing should be organized. Your copyright should be organized. If you don't have your copyrights done, then you have no authority over yourself. And the label could swipe that from you. But if you already own copyrights, Mm -hmm. then you can put yourself in a position where you can either sell or license them for a certain term to a record company. And that is the strongest way that you can be. You want to create a radio profile. It's a story. Like meaning a story is that I can give you a binder and you can flip the pages and they'll see week to week how much airplay you're getting, what stations are, pl- are are playing you, when it goes up, when it goes down. And they can see by looking at this, they will understand that whether you made money or you lost money, you put it into the right places. And the record company will look at you and go, wow, this guy's a safe investment or she's a safe investment. Let's move with her now. It's safe to give this person an advance. They're not just going to go fuck it off on popping bottles and getting a car. So a lot of these people don't understand that the only way to really be successful is take a very organized and pragmatic approach. Tory Lanez, I don't know anything about his record deal or what happened, but no matter how you flip it, he walked in there and he was probably poor and he walked out pretty stable. Whether he wanted to be on the label or not, I get annoyed when you see people complain about that. Yeah, because these people made you and all you have to do for the rest of your life is hop on a stage in front of people 
you sing a few silly little songs, get clapped for, and walk home with between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars for the rest of your life potentially. I don't know why people complain about record companies, but I don't think that rep- record companies and signing them <laughs> necessary. And I don't think it's the uh, the answer to everyone's problem. I think I think what it is, Michael, with that is because people still think the I think they're thinking the old way of how the record labels work, and the, you know, making you a star. That's what they're thinking about. Oh, they have the money. You know, but no, little do you know that that's a loan. Okay, the money that you're giving, they're giving you, that's a freaking loan. Yeah, they have a meeting and they order a pizza. You're paying for it. Exactly. Okay, you know what I'm saying? So, like, when people tell me, when they ask me, "Oh, why are you independent?" I own my shit. I own everything. Mm-hmm. I own my music. I own everything. I own the rights. If I say I want it on a commercial, I can do it. And I'll give let me give you an example. We did a Samsung commercial. Mm-hmm. We landed a Samsung commercial. You want to know who made the commercial? We did. We pitched it to Samsung. And it's never like been done before. Issue deal? Like, aren't you getting the, the budget to do like like three to six more of those? Yeah. That's we pitched a commercial to Samsung. And I said to them, we said to them, this is how you sell your product. This is why you're having a problem not being able to communicate to producers and artists. And they were shocked. Never yeah. been it's never been done before in the history. Samsung told us nobody's ever done this. How'd you how'd you make that happen? Because both of you are really saying really, really great things for an independent artist that wants to make sure that their copyrights are right or wants to to make sure they have everything together and then be able to pitch to the radio or pitch to Samsung. What was the catalyst that made those relationships happen? And like, how do you take an artist from I have my song on Spotify? It's it's doing okay, but now I want to pitch it to Samsung or I want to get on the radio. Okay, well, with me, there's another twist to me in my life. I'm not just an artist, I'm a network engineer. I build and design computer networks. So that's a that's a I'm a girl geek. Cisco? No, not Cisco. Oh. No, I do more of the 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 Windows stuff. You know, I do on the back for yeah. those that are watching all servers, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so they had a product. And it was at NAM. It was at NAM. What's and, that? Um, it's the it's the National Artist Music uh, Conference. It's the biggest conference of all music in yeah, the music yeah. industry. Music yeah. and technology, yeah. Yeah, and they mix music and technology together. And Samsung was there, and they saw me and Michael Ashby do a presentation, and they liked it so much they asked me to present something for a Samsung conference. They brought me there with Michael. We showed them how to use their product. They were shocked. We basically cloned Michael's OS onto the small SSD drive that they gave us, the T5. It was a one terabyte. We cloned his OS on there. We were literally recording on this little size SSD drive recording our music in there live in front of them. They and when the presentation was done they were like we've never seen anything like this. We didn't e- they said we didn't even know our product could do that. And so once that happened then now you had leverage and you were like yo did they so you pitched a commercial after that? I, I, I right there right then and there I said I said let me ask you something are you having a problem selling this product? They said yes. I said well what are you, who are you trying to reach? We're trying to reach artists. We're trying to reach producers. Oh. And I said, okay, can you let me look at what you have with my team? And then I will come back with something to present to you. They said, do it. Show us. Yep. I went, got my people in my got people in my in my circle that I knew were the bomb for photography and stuff. And I said, okay, I need you guys to help me here. We got it. We got we got a potential uh, commercial deal here, mm-hmm. and I was. They were like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "We're gonna make this happen," and we did it. And we showed them the stills. We gave them the whole concept. They they were salivating for the damn commercial. They were like, "Can you please just show us the video? We want to see it." We sent the video. They were like, "We want to buy it from you." So and that's amazing. Three series. 
there's a lot of pieces there people need to pay attention to. So you took yeah. your day job, you took your network that you automatically had because of your yeah. education, yeah. and you used that opportunity. You blended both. Mm -hmm. You performed when they asked to, and then you solved a problem. And you solved the problem for them, which is going to put more money in their pocket. You invested in yourself, like Michael just said, with your own production. Yes. You took it to them, and now you're getting a return. How much did they, did they pay you for that, if you don't mind telling folks? I can't tell you that. Okay. Well, you got paid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did get paid. And let me tell you something. Samsung is good. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's the thing. That's the thing people just need to hear. It's like, like Michael was just saying, it doesn't happen overnight. There's not just some one, one straight way. You have to invest in yourself and you really, really have to get after it and make shit happen for you yes. as an independent artist. And Michael, I would assume it's the same way if you want to get on the radio, right? Sort of. Let me point out one more thing. Get that she kind of brushed over. This wasn't just about four walling your project. You know, it wasn't like, hey, let's go make a commercial kind of deal. She understood, I'm going to make a commercial. I'm going to put myself in the commercial. I'm going to put the people that Samsung approached in the commercial. I'm going to create the commercial. But no matter what happens, whether or not the commercial deal is a, a buyout or not, or however Samsung chooses to advertise it, she was smart enough to own her copyrights, own her publishing, and the whole commercial is playing her song throughout it. So no matter what happens, that commercial, if it gets aired on television or if it gets used for um, you know, internet ads, even if it's just on um, YouTube, every click turns into income. And that was the, the catch. So she made sure she covered her bases, with, whether it be royalty income from sound exchange a royalty income from her um, as a writer from BMI, a royalty income as a uh, as a publisher. Yep. And then also anytime they reissue it, she would end up getting, you know, a payout for the use of the copyright within it. So she owns part of it. Samsung owns their drive that she is marketing, mm -hmm. put two different copyrights together and then presented something. So even if the deal went sour, she's always in a position to earn. And it was three levels of earning. There's three tiers to that. Plus, you're marketing your own personal records. And she had that record finished for like three years already. Yes. So she took something. And, I start, and I started seeing Spike happen with my damn song. And I, yeah. I was like, I started seeing payments come in. I was like, what the hell's happening here? And I said, oh, yeah. that's right. The song is in the commercial. Oh, it is working. Which, I was like, this really it? works. Yeah. What's, so, what's so the name of the song? Like, Starlight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Michael, you said there were three tiers of earning. What, what were the three tiers there? In that particular situation, there's the, the you know, the payoff from Samsung. That's number one. Number two would be any potential earnings. Like, you know, when they run a TV commercial, right? Like I've negotiated TV commercials for people, you know, and like, you know, like I did one for Chubby Checker. And what I did was I, I negotiated that while the commercial runs on television, I want a percentage of whatever gets brought in from the sales because mm -hmm. you're using my face or my client's face to market your product. So give us something, even if it's like half a percent, give us something so we're in it to win it. Cause you'd be amazed like, you know, Oreo cookies could go out and sell, you know, a hundred million dollars worth of Oreo cookies, but they're playing the twist. Mm -hmm. So give us something, come on, yeah. you're twisting the thing off. You're, 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 you're taking something that's the fabric of history and you're, you're putting into your, your product, you know? So there's those two avenues of income. Then there's the musical and mechanical avenues of income. There is the, the if come, which is potential sales, be it like Spotify downloads, record sales, whatever. Okay. The other side of it is sound exchange, which is the performance royalty, which mm -hmm. is like the singer and the label, like the actual recording, which just so happens to be her and the label just so happens to be her. So with sound exchange, she would end up getting 40% 40 of the money would go to her record company. And yeah. the other 60% of the money goes to her as a performer. Then there's the people that wrote it, which would be, um, uh, if I remember correctly, it's, it's you and Brandon Howard. Yeah. And then, so those two people would end up getting their writing shares at, from BMI, CSAC, ASCAP, whichever it is, that particular thing is with BMI. Then there is the publishing royalty, which is the other half of that cookie. And it would be the same payouts, but the publisher, um, for the most part, is <laughs> Melissa herself, which would be Melissa B. Music and the BMI. And then you have, uh, what else is there? I think that covers it. I don't think there's anything else. No, that's a good one, Michael. This was yeah, this, this was a good example. 
Yeah, so that's how, um, you know, that's how those things will work. And then the other thing is on top of that is if this becomes something where like one of these commercials out of the six that are being made become like a national ad, then she would have to swap out from being in a musician's union to joining automatically transferring to SAG-AFTRA and then she would get paid every time she's on the screen just as a principal role because she made herself a principal in a, in a national commercial. Yeah. Hold, up. Hold up. So because you put yourself in the commercial, you can get your SAG card, you can get paid for that too? If it, becomes if it goes team, on television. Right now it's just yeah, on the yeah. internet. It's but if it's, yes, principal yeah, role. It would, it would wow. automatically be union. So everybody in there, we can convert to unions. I mean, like I'm, I'm in, like I've been in SAG most of my life and I switched and I'm with the musicians union because I make music. I don't really care about doing the TV stuff, even though I still do <laughs> TV work. So you would just swap, you know, because they're all in conjunction with each other. So she would be getting a SAG royalty, which would allow her to be able to, um, you know, there's lots of perks. Like you get to go to the dentist for free, things like that. Like you get the discounts at Target, you know. So when you are about your business, you might spend a little bit more to get in there, but you're also going to save a lot more in the long run. You know, you get uh, discounts on things like AT and T, travel expenses, all sorts of stuff. So you want to unionize yourself. That's another way to make sure that it's you're covering just, your face. It's just but being innovative, important. right, Michael? It's just you got to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, you know what it was? She went up and she decided, hey, I'm going to help make this giant make more money rather than yeah. self-serving. She could have spent that money making a music video for herself and get a thousand views. Or she could spend that same money making a 30 second to you know one minute commercial and go become part of something that's bigger than she is, which is a giant company that's like Samsung. You know what's really funny? A few um, weeks ago, I actually ordered and bought that drive not because of Melissa or myself <laughs> or anything else. I bought it because it was actually the thing that was needed. So it was just kind of, I was comparing it to everything else, but it wasn't, you know, it, it was just a weird thing. So it's, it's something that you really would use. But see, you uh, associate me with that now. Yeah, that was, it was also like when you did the, um, what was it called? The, ti not TikTok, Snow? Is it called Snow? Snow app, yes. That it, It's it's like the, the Asian version of uh, Snapchat. Of, uh, Snapchat, yeah. Same thing. She found good ways to market. Yeah, music. Snap Snapchat has a um has a competitor, and the competitor's name is Snow App. So when um I was I had my album out, it was called my computer love album, and I had a song called Mind Frame, and I was trying to do something really different. And I um this is another thing of me doing something outside the box. Yeah. I was like, huh, I want to do a music video, but I don't want to do it normal. I was like, oh, okay, let me use some filters. Then I started looking at Snapchat. Snapchat was so limited with their filters. And I was like, mm. I was like, they got to have some competition. So I went online, I looked it up, and, there, and oddly enough, Snapchat had a competitor in South Korea. And they had more than they did. They had more followers than they did. I think like 20 million, 30 million. I was like, oh, crap. So I used their filters and I created a small music video. That's how I did my music video mind frame. I did it all on my freaking phone from their filters. And I had a guy edit it for me. And then I sent it to them and I said, hey, I just did a whole music video off of all your filters. Make me an ambassador. <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you send it to them? I emailed it to them. It's I randomly really just to went to the website, door. found the email. Boom, I boom. did all my research. I found out who the president of the company was and everything. And I emailed everybody. Basically, and I said, stop, stop. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to emphasize that though, because I don't think people realize like how much you got to stop motherfuckers to really make shit happen. Like, yeah, you got to be persistent. But yeah, I've emailed the president of 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 uh, Spotify before. Yeah. Yep. There you went. Yeah. Here's the thing. Punchline yeah. is she ends up walking away with them giving her her own filter and people are going yeah. on it and they're playing her song and it says her name and it says the title of the song. And it was like amazing advertising because you got 20 million people potentially. Yeah. Or how many? Like it brought, people, it whatever. brought people to my people. Yeah. They created a filter for me, Dorian. Mm -hmm. So people were on it and they saw the cool glasses and my music was playing and it would say Melissa B. And it wow. said the song, right? So then they look up the song, they found the music video, that's, oh shit, look at the music video. They were like, snow brought, <laughs> the snow app brought me here. If anybody's listening to this and they go look up my song, Mind Frame, 
you'll see everybody from South Korea in there. I got so many views off of that application, pointing it back to my music video. Going back to the business side, so did, so they use your likeness, correct? Yeah. So do you get paid off of that? For the app? Only if for the app? No, 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 no. no. That's different. Yeah, not, they don't operate like Facebook. So like on Instagram, yeah. put, if you play music in your store on Instagram, like, you know, when you go to the setting and you click on it and you can find the song and you can pick the spot in the song where it plays, yeah. you will get a royalty for that. And that's something that's collectible. But with this thing, the Snow app, you got to think, she could have spent money making an expensive music video. Instead, she invested the time in herself rather than trying to get the clout. She, again, went back to a bigger company, worked out a rational deal and said, hey, can I do this? Like, you have to think about it in a way of, do I need money right now? Why do I need the exposure right now? And the key was have my name there, have the song there, yeah. and have it playing the music while it's going the whole time. So the when people get was more important. It, look it up, you get those objective listeners. And that's what spiked the sales up. So did she get paid in the long run? Yeah, but the level of exposure that she got from that, she couldn't have afforded to begin with. And that's what made the difference. So sometimes you got to pick and choose your battles. Give and, and take. Give and yeah. take. Melissa, you um I was I was talking to somebody the other day about my life and I've been very unconventional with everything that I had to do in my life. Like even getting into college, I got in on like a first generation college student program. Like my mom had me, I was a C section baby. Like mm -hmm. when I got into college basketball, like I would never start at the beginning of the season. Every coaching job I started, it was like October. I got into grad school on a probationary period. Everything in my life is unconventional, even with the with with the music shit. Yeah. It sounds like because you're you're in the tech space, not only are things unconventional for you, it's like you look for that shit. Like is what like is that how you market yourself? Like what is Melissa looking at when she's on social media or like, you know what? Like this seems like a good opportunity for me. Like what does that come from? And do you feel like that's how your life is when it comes to marketing your music? From, yeah, for me, I, I definitely do because for me, Michael can attest to this. People know me. Uh, uh, they coined me the girl geek. Like, they coined me the girl geek in the music industry. Like, when people see, they're like, you're Melissa B. Oh, my God, you're the geek. You, Everything they think about me is all computers. They know I know a lot of stuff about computers. And I'm in my own lane. I think that's what I want. That's the one thing I wanted to do because I was like, I'm not Beyonce. I'm not Mariah Carey. I'm not all these other people. I, I I have other talents and I like to combine both of them. And that's the thing. Like now with the, the day and age that we're in, everybody's on a computer. Yes. Everybody's talking on computers and phones. That's the one thing I know. That's the one thing I know. And that's the one thing I know how to communicate with my fans and the people around the world. And I think that's why people get me. And that's why I get them because I know I know how to I know how to talk the talk. And literally there have been there I've heard stories of labels trying to find someone similar to me and I'm like you can't copy me. There's <laughs> good luck trying. There's no girl that does what I do. Michael, as somebody who's been in the industry for a long time or like you grew up in it, you you've seen you've seen the shifts and like the changes. Do you think like going forward, the traditional pop star, the traditional rap star where like Mariah, great example, right? Everybody who knows her story are like, man, you don't. She had a great voice. She was in New York. She was at a party, gave Tommy Mottola her her demo. He put it inside the car. He was he said, wait. Well, maybe this is the PR story. So maybe Michael Stop. wants to get <laughs> Stop. All right. Go ahead. Go, please, please go. Let me make something clear. This is going to turn into a soundbite. So here we go. Yeah. Now, Alice and I run a Latin label. Okay. It's tiny. We're just starting it out. Yeah. And the first client that Natalis goes and gets is Brenda K. Star. So we did a record for Brenda. And it was it's a cover song. You know, just to test the waters out. And uh, with that situation that's going on is, um, hold on a second. Hey. Okay, with that situation, we have, uh, man, I'm trying to figure out how to say this without swearing and going, what? Nah, man, go. No filters yeah, here. No filters. Yeah. <laughs> 
Tommy Matola. There's what happened. There's what Tommy wished had happened. And then there's what Tommy said that happened. Mm -hmm. And they're not all the same. Mm. Mariah Carey came because she was a background singer for Brenda K. Stock. But Mariah was hungry and broke and, and living with like five girls in an apartment kind of thing. Brenda would go over and Brenda would bring her clothes and take care of her. And I think Brenda's mom too. Like they were really, really, really close. Brenda was almost like her, her daughter or something. And Brenda wanted to blow her up. Brenda was the one who said, you know what? I have all these opportunities. Let me backtrack a little bit. This girl really needs this. Let's get behind her. All right. And let be honest with you, Brenda and I bump heads often. We, we did, but she's still legit. And Mariah Carey, that situation happened because Brenda went to Tommy and they were trying to do something with Brenda and Brenda said, yo, you have to check this girl out. And Brenda was the one that pushed the tape on him. Brenda was the one that nagged him to listen to it. Brenda was the one that fought for Mariah to get Mariah where she is. And Mariah has openly acknowledged it a few times, but there's no need to constantly rehash it. What makes it confusing is that Tommy went out and told a whole different story. <laughs> and Tommy used his, um, from the best of my understanding, I have to be politically correct, used his situation, power, influence yeah. to get Mariah in a corner. At the same time, where he like married her and everything else. And at the same time, in Tommy's defense, when you're the head of a record company or one of the top people in the promotions department, there's no way you're going to let your girlfriend and your wife fall flat on her face. Yeah. So she got all the special treatment and that budget came rolling out. And the only thing that was really great about it is that Mariah Carey just so happens to be an incredible, forget the voice, fuck the voice. Her voice is great. doesn't matter. It's the fact that Mariah is an incredible writer. Yeah. She yes, she is. She's an amazing songwriter. Yeah. The way she, she inspires me. Structures and everything else. But Mariah came up under Brenda and that story is is not really the story that people think. But what was the point of the the thing, the statement you're making? I just get frustrated when I hear something nah, so it's all good. <laughs> an incredible person. <laughs> because the thing is, Brenda's not eating the way Brenda deserves to eat. You know, like like her lifestyle's not bad. She's doing great, but it's she's not living with Mariah Carey money, and she should be. There was a finder's fee she was entitled to. She was supposed to help co-write a lot of Mariah stuff, and then they just. It's like Tommy got in and iced her because I think Brenda was maybe a, a point of reason that would have helped protect Mariah. Because you remember Mariah went through a lot getting out of that deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that maybe Tommy isolated Mariah to break her down, to make her almost slavish. And luckily yeah. she got out of that. But yeah, so let's, now that we've cleared up history. <laughs> I think I think it segues to what we were actually talking about, though, because oh. like back then when, when you wanted to, to get on, like you had to go through those channels in some capacity, like even somebody like Master P, who we all know about his independent story. He still eventually had to get his 8515 deal with Universal, I think. So now things have changed. Right. You can go straight to the fans, D2C, et cetera. But fans are so inundated with so much music. Do you think that, like Melissa was saying, how she has branded herself as the girl geek, she has other stuff that she can do. Do you think that that's going to be the future of music is like, OK, you make music, but what else is it that you do that people can relate to? And that's going to elevate people to the top of the billboard charts. Or do you think it will always be kind of the same? I don't think it's anything. I don't think it's any of those things at all. I think what happens is. It's almost like the way you travel to a different country, you learn that the history is a little bit different, okay? And what they tell you in America is gonna, not gonna be the same thing as they tell you in another country. It's, it's mm -hmm. whoever wins the war gets to write the story. And that's kind of like what I just explained with Tommy. Tommy Matola can go write his book and people just believe it because he wrote it. Mm -hmm. it. Doesn't mean that it's entirely historically accurate. You know, it's, it's one person's perspective of the truth. Like for example, and you watch that Temptations um, mini series and there's that thing ain't nobody come to see you otis that whole yeah. like that whole hey, section, that never happened that <laughs> never happened hell of a line though <laughs> Dude, listen david ruffin jr okay is 
probably one of my closest friends and we've been working together for eons, you know, or just out there with him in LA. And David's the one that, you know, like he, he forget it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to digress. The history is not always accurate. Mm. That Temptations story mm-hmm. is Otis Williams' version of what happened. Otis said, oh, they're going to make it David Ruffin and the Temptations. And he said it never happened. Well, you know what? I have physically held the original Motown recordings in my hand where it says David Ruffin and the Temptations on the stamp. It did happen. So wow. explain that. Okay, I've seen it. There, there were, it was right in my my room when I was sleeping last month, every fucking day. So when we have to, we, we have to kind of come back and go. The, how do I say this? The record companies are selling you a propaganda story that you need them. Yeah. Going along with the Temptations, let's think about this. Motown was an independent label. Yeah, Motel was an independent label when they had Stevie Wonder, the Jackson Five, and everybody was playing them. Dax, Otis Redding, independent label. Elvis, independent label. Little Richard, indie. Okay, everything that you hear from Phil Spector, whether it's Be My Baby, you know, Christmas, all that. Phil Less Records, it was his own independent. He was the publisher, he was the manufacturer. He was the person that mixed the records, produced the records, organized them, marketed them, called the stations. He is like a god to me. He's crazy as shit, but he's like a god to me. Completely independent. So those are some, that that is literally the soundtrack of like modern American culture. And they're all independent. So what do we need a giant record company for? The record business is barely a hundred years old. They were all independent. It's just that when certain people got older, they started merging, 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 and it became something with, you know, these big major labels. Like even like Puffy, Puffy was funded by Clyde Davis because Clyde yeah. Davis knew he was too white to do a rap label, but yeah. Puffy was this great promoter. But then you got other guys like Jermaine Dupri that really did that independently. Mm-hmm. You know, even yeah, so like, so deaf, yeah. Mm-hmm. Babyface and L.A. Reid had sponsors, but. Before that, when they were cranking out the early Pebbles records, they were independent. So I think everyone's blinded. And I think they start to think that, oh, you're with a major company because you're L.A. Reid. It's like, no, nah, L.A. Reid was making major money before that. That's why they realized, hey, you're doing so well. We need to join you. Like, mm-hmm. for example, I was totally independent working with a guy named Gary Lefkowitz. All right, Gary trained me in the radio promotion business. So I guess we'll get back to that. Um, around 2004, I met Chubby Checker. By 2006... We did a single called Knock Down the Walls by 2000, by November 4th, 2007. We got Chubby Checker, his first number one billboard record in 40 years. Oh my God. The rest was history. And by May 2008, I believe, Sony was knocking on the door going, hey, we're going to help you. Do you think you'll join us? And, you know, then we teamed up with them. But did we need them? No. Do we need them after that? No. Was I getting, was I, was I, taking a hand truck and delivering my own records to Virgin myself and traveling to different record stores myself, delivering the records so I could cut my costs. Yeah. Was I taking independent records and selling 80,000 units at a Best Buy on my own? Yeah. Well, 20,000 pulling in $80,000 to be, you know, sorry, I, I got to flip that, but who the hell needs a major label? I mean, I don't know. I don't get why anyone even believes this fucking dude. It's a fish story. I mean, I think every, great, but you don't need it. <laughs> I think everybody believes it because that's, I mean, it comes back to marketing and all of us were like, we, we grew up TV, radio. That's like, when you name your top five rappers ever, all of them chart on the billboard, all of them were on the radio, even if you're deep into lyrics or not. So that's why a lot of people believe that. But today, like with all the technology and everything, yeah. How does an independent artist get on the radio then if you don't need the label? Because that seems like all that they can really do for you now is radio promotion. But I hear there's guys like you that can really help. How does it happen? They hire me. That's like, like, <laughs> like Gary. I was helping Gary doing calls. We we just finished doing BB Rexa. Think about that. They want to Grammy, but they're, they're calling us, the independent promoters. Like the, the the story of Casablanca Records, another independent, the independent that made the Village People, Kiss, Donna Summer. That was an independent label. That's a good book oh, to read. Remember, Michael? Yeah. If yeah, you want to, there's Harris. a book about Casablanca, about the 
records about how they came about. And yeah, and if people want it, to really know it, the history, they should read that book. Yeah, and those guys were crazy. Like they literally would spend a million dollars to make seven hundred and fifty thousand back. They didn't care because they knew they were they were changing the the business. But these go. What was your question? How does a person get on the rate on the air? Or is yeah, it like how does an independent artist who's a rapper? How do they hire you? Yeah, call me. Just like Melissa like, went to snow, <laughs> called them. You know, just don't don't you know where to find my, them now. No, you don't. You don't slide in my DM and go, yo. Yeah. <laughs> Please, bro, that doesn't work. You you come correct. You just if you take yourself seriously and you present mm -hmm. yourself in a serious way, of course I'm gonna take you seriously. What's the difference between me and you? Nothing. You know, I'm a human being. You know, we're human beings. We're acting humanly. I just do a job and I have access to things, and I'm gonna help you think through how you're gonna market yourself. There are a lot of opportunities to get out there, test your record, do whatever you got to do. You can get on all sorts of terrestrial radio. There's satellite radio. There's things that maybe you just want to run a radio campaign so you want to brag on the internet and see if maybe anyone likes your record. Overseas too is good. A good I don't test. do that. I know you don't. I I know how to do it though. Yeah. But see, my thing is, I guarantee. So like, um. I will only guarantee in areas where I can sue people. So I have yeah. multiple lawyers and I know if I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, work out a deal with a radio station, they're going to play me and I'm going to under promise and over deliver. Once I go out of the country, I have no legal jurisdiction. So I can just get ripped off right and left. So that's why it's like the things that Melissa did with snow. It was smart because she worked through an app. There's a paper trail. She could figure out how it's going to yep. go. She can check on it virally from here, but I can't physically get myself to the Philippines and make sure they're playing my song. And mm -hmm. I don't even know if they're even registered or if they're even logging my, my information. There's no way for me to track it. I have to use things like SoundScan, MediaBase. There's tools that radio promoters use to be able to access the numbers to see it. So, um, but yeah, like there's, how does an artist do it? It's the same way. I mean, even think of it this way. Corey Feldman might be wildly famous, but he's wildly famous for being an actor first, mm. an actor, a film producer, something like that. Now he runs a little independent label, which is just, it's really Corey Feldman. He's the artist and he's got his band truth movement. And I am sort of like, I kind of function as the vice president of the label, I guess you could say. And what we do is we understand that by law, five to like, I think it's like five to 15% of all major radio stations by law have to play independent companies. It can't just be owned by corporate conglomerates that are traded on the stock market. That's illegal. Can, can you define so, independent? Because that seems like bullshit. Define what independent means. It seems like bullshit. Independent means that you are one guy by yourself with a tiny LLC with no staff and just maybe two people. And those two people are doing all the work of like 25. Yep. And can, you're funding yourself. So can you give an that, example of a song that's hot right now that the radio's playing that's independent? That's hot right now as far as commercially or culturally viable or or even or even big. Like it doesn't have to be right now. Just the example that that we all know that when it was on the radio, it was an independent push what song. Back one more. I mean, yeah, I know they did the theirs. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The first person I thought I was like, that's a yeah. perfect example. Yep. Yep. Yeah. A, a lot of people that start out as one hit wonders, they they're starting out independent and then they trade into a major label because the major companies are going. Hey, dude, why compete with them? We could just buy them. That yeah. person's gonna, that person already spent, because you have to understand how the major label looks at the major label goes, wow, you just spent probably $20,000 out of your own pocket and you did all the groundwork for us. Yeah. So we could go sign you for 30 grand <laughs> so that you made your money back and then we'll take it from here because now we know you're a sure thing. Yep. Does that make sense to you? It's exactly so, how Facebook got Instagram. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. We're just going to wait it out and see what it's, they, it's weird. They get so caught up in like faking their followers and whatever. Mm -hmm. and yes. they don't the authenticity that people are looking for is can you turn a profit or can you break even? And when you get that level of radio, you might not turn the profit, but they see that you've invested so much in your promotion and building a brand and getting people's attention. Sometimes the radio, sometimes the um, record company, they will look at your media based reports. Media based is how you track radio. Yeah. And they will look at this media based report. And what they can see is how, what was the percentage of people 
that when they heard your record on the radio, did they change the station? Yes. And if your if your tune out ratio, because they're tuning out, if your tune out ratio is extremely low, like if it's like fifteen percent or under, they're gonna pay attention because that means that subconsciously people are accepting you into their lives and and you're creating the soundtrack of their life. So they're they're the people are going to parties together. They're getting into car accidents. They're breaking up. They're fighting. They're they're driving their kids to school, and and they're getting you're 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 sinking into their subconscious. So the record company is going to look for that. How much of that kind of activity did you get? And if that activity looks good, then you look like a pretty decent person. And they can come up to you and they can say, you know what? I can tell this person is earning publishing money because I can look at their spin count and I can see what it is. It gives you the power as an artist to walk into a record company when they say. Why should we sign you? You have a notebook or not a notebook, yes. but like a binder full of paperwork showing this is what I've earned. This is the airplay. Here are my reports. This is this. This is my tune-out ratio. You could print it all, slide it across the table, and just wait for the response. You know, you want to have proof as to who you, you want are. You want to have leverage. You want to have leverage. Like the worst thing I ever hear is when some artist goes, man, when I blow up, I'm going to take care of you too. It's like, bro, I don't need you to take care of me. I'm good. You know, like I'm, I'm putting you on, like chill. I, exactly. I hate when an artist comes up to me and says something like, uh, you know, like I, I'm going to change the world. I'm innovated. Oh, my art's going to, you know, change the way people think. I'm like, I don't care. Nobody cares. <laughs> it's all been done before. We've seen it all before. Yeah. Do you have the budget? And are you, are you an investable opportunity for others? And do you make sense? Like, is the brand good? Is Pepsi going to want to hire you? No, you could. You could, like even with these these like Instagram models, like yeah, you could be as hot as you want to be, but if you don't have substance, you're not going anywhere. That's why you're gonna see. Yeah. Like, that's why Melissa's not out there half naked on Instagram. She doesn't need to. She's beating them here and she's beating them here. So if she can do that and she can, she doesn't have to go out thotting herself around to go book a Samsung commercial. Well, here we go. Like some people really just don't get it, you no. know. And they're living for now. And you gotta understand, like, you know, your your, your looks are gonna fade, mm. but your voice doesn't usually fade. And even if it does, Frank Sinatra was up there with Alzheimer's. He didn't even remember where he was half the time he's singing his songs. He was just on autopilot. You know, he had like a little silk toupee. People didn't even realize he was getting toupees that looked real, like as if he was balding. And Michael, just I have a question. Up. I have a question. Yeah. Right now, now, now with all my, no, with all my music, so Dorian, this is a good question to ask him. With all my music, everything, my catalog, all of that, the stuff that I've accomplished, what do you think I'd be worth for a label? If I got a label deal, if I was offered a label deal, what do you think they, they would offer me? And can you break it down? Why, like, her numbers and songs and charts and stuff? It's so messed up that you're asking me this kind of question. On <laughs> no, it's good. I think this like, is good because then people actually get to under really understand this mm -hmm. because... I, 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 I'm not with no label yet. I, I'm doing this on my what, own. What do, you, what do you mean? What would what would the signing bonus be? Or what would like what do you think I would what do you think I'm worth? Price? Like based off of everything I've done, everything you know about me as an artist, and we walked in the door and we sat at a table, what do you think you would say to them? Be like, this is what she's worth. I'll come any lower. I'm gonna, give you two, I'm gonna give you two answers. And one of them might make you crack your phone and the other one's going to make you want to hug it. So don't crack it because it'll be all right at the end. Okay. Uh, they're not going to look at you in the way that you would hope they would look at you at. They're going to look at your, they're going to look at your earnings. They're going to look at your numbers. They're going to look at your front and yeah. go, okay, this might be worth to us as like a, a you know, upfront signing bonus. We'd be like, Hey, we could probably give her like 30 to 50 grand up front. And this would be a because you got to remember, corporate America they want to flip a huge profit. Yeah. So they're gonna want to give you a tiny little bit up front. Here's the problem: Melissa's network engineer. She's she's making six figures. She doesn't need that. She could wipe her ass with that fifty grand. So the label <laughs> has to cover more because okay. they gotta have enough to make her want to walk away from her nine to five. The same situation goes on with this uh, other client of mine, Joe Ski Love, who's the guy that did the Kiwi Dance back in the day. He's also a network engineer making six figures and then he goes on the road sometimes and he'll make another 30 grand a year just doing shows he's in the same situation and people come to him all the time and he's like nah i don't need it because he's comfortable he doesn't need to stress mm -hmm. so the label's gonna have to look at this and go if she's doing this by herself we're gonna have to come up with a whole lot more to get her to want to sign with us because she already has her shit together yeah so she'll get a different type of deal she would end up getting a deal i'm assuming 
if I was in charge, they'd probably tell her, all right, we're going to give you 50 grand cash as a bonus, not a recoup. Because she doesn't need the money. So that's number one. Number two, they would have to come up with a fantastic promotional marketing budget for her. The other thing is that they would they would incorporate this. So she would end up getting a, the kind of contract that would be worth, you know, in the ballpark of the two hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollar range. But would she get that much money as like a advance in cash? No, they would never do that because it would be useless because they would have to come to her and prove to her that they can do their end of the deal because she's already booked too many things that they would even have trouble booking for her on her own. So they would have to offer her, um, they would have to do a, I don't think they would allow her to continue as an independent because the quality of the music that she already has out is major label quality. So that becomes an issue for them. So they're going to want to do a copyright license for probably seven to 10 years mm. or at least duration of the contract where she, they will, she would have to turn over all of the music that she made to them for a certain amount of time for them to market them to distribute so on and so forth. So this way they kind of have her by the balls because if she has her old music, if she has one huge single, it might open them up to all her old, old stuff and now she's making money and they're not. So they need to recoup that 50 grand cash. That they need to <laughs> this is good. So, you there? Yeah. Just yeah, breaking up a little bit. I'm not breaking up. No, yeah, I'm not either. I see Michael. Michael's frozen. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. You're good. You're good. I'm I plug my phone. Okay. So that would be the first thing. All right. So then from there, they would have to look at what your potential earnings would be after that. Okay. The potential earnings are kind of limitless because the thing is, you've already shown that you can be a principal in an acting type situation. So that's one. You already have your arrangement and your writing. So they would probably put her on a publishing deal. On the publishing deal, they would probably give her another, you know, probably like fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and she would have to sit there and and write and arrange songs excessively, and they would want tons of material out of her. Melissa's kind of the kind, Melissa's more like a Whitney Houston kind of artist, where she can make her own music, but at the same time, if they brought in writers, they can make, the label can make tons of money off of giving her great songs and just having her sing them. And I think that that would be the safest way for them to go for them to make money off of her. So the deal would be probably something like that. The so, headache is that. Go ahead. Uh, I like it. Yeah, a few things there. Um, you said that her 50000 would be a bonus and not recoupable. So that is an option for artists. No, that's an option for people like that, not for artists. When you say artists, then some, you know, some knucklehead who's just like a, a rapper who has a couple catchy little tunes will think it's that. You have to understand, Melissa's on like a, her vocally, she's in like a Jennifer Hudson kind of space, a Jordan Sparks kind of space, mm -hmm. that the record company could, once they have her by the balls in like a contractual situation, they'll be like, hey, we got the Grammys coming up and we need someone, someone died and we need someone to sing this heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching song and they need, we need an Ave Maria. And they would make her go do it because she's got a, a power voice, you know? And if there's a, uh, if the record company wanted to use her as an asset, they would say, hey, we have another movie, like the Trolls movie. And the way you're seeing, like, all these people doing random collaborations for this Trolls movie, Trolls movie those, some of those songs are already made. And they're just like, hey, we're just going to use your voice. Boom. And she would get stuck doing a lot of stuff like that. Her royalty kickback, in theory, would suck because most of her royalties would end up being just performance royalties. Yeah. They wouldn't want to give her the publishing. They wouldn't want to give her those things. And that's what artists need to prepare for. But here's the thing. Let's say she has a two album deal and she does a bunch of little things in between. The exposure that she's getting from those things are going to catapult her to a whole nother stratosphere as far as public attention. Yeah. They're out when she leaves the company and she terminates the uh, licensing on her, the licensing deal or when it expires rather for her masters of her original material. The record company is going to end up keeping her major label stuff, but all of her stuff that she did before and everything she does after, because she has a, a her, her quality level side, she would end up making bank off of that stuff. And that would be the cool thing. She'll be walking with enough money to take her own records, go to the billboard, spike them out. And when the record company wants to do a Melissa B. Greatest Hits or a box set, or Rhino wants to do it, like a label like Rhino, they would have to end up going to Melissa and saying, hey, we're going to need a couple of these indie records too. And then she's got a new licensing deal for those independent records. And she would get famous enough from the situation with the major label, or at least enough notoriety to start booking 
sync deals on small screen television shows and things like that for you know eons to come which is a big part of what i do is i i like to music to tv and film so yeah. i'm not talking out my ass this is exactly what i do i get my record on the radio i get it buzzing a little bit and then i can plug it into tv shows so that was, that was a really good good answer and breakdown of everything i know a lot of people got some out of that so going exactly. back uh, so so going back a little bit i know you talked about the stuff that the labels look for you as a person who helps with sync you as a person who's a, who's a radio promoter what do you look for in an artist or a client that you want to take on are there metrics that you're looking at like is there something that artists can prepare to do to so when they pre present it to you in a professional way it catches your attention outside of like the brand and all that shit like is there something specific sanity <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny that's, that, I'm not being funny sanity I have people that will walk up to me and they think that they're amazing and they think that they're going to do this and whatever and they're completely irrational and completely illogical mm -hmm. nothing they're doing makes any fucking sense and they're so caught up on on, on feeling themselves it's, it's, it's obnoxious it's like they're writing they're making music and they're writing a love note to them from them for them it has nothing to do with me they might as well just go in a corner and jerk off it has nothing to do with me and they're intolerable people to deal with. You have to be rational. This is a business. It is a business of marketing and money. The, the, let me, I can't answer that question because <laughs> sanity is, but let me explain it to you like this. Uh -huh. You wake up in the morning, you smell fresh brewed coffee, you're tired, you got to go to work. And you're like, oh man, this smells great. What is this? Oh, it's too much or whatever. Okay. And then you're looking for a mug and you find the mug, but this coffee is scorching. You know, it's like those crazy people that go to Starbucks and they're just like, make it hotter, right? You put it in the mug and the mug is burning hot, right? And then you go to pick it up and you drop it all over the place. Now you've burned yourself. Now, why did that happen? Because the mug didn't have a handle. You don't want to be a coffee mug without a handle because even if all the contents of what you have is amazing and you don't have a handle on yourself, if you don't make yourself approachable, if people can't, you know, reach you and understand you and work with you and you're just on fire all the time, no, you, it's, it's, you can't work with a person like that. Yep. It, it doesn't function. You have to have all of those things and you have to have a handle on yourself. You have to have sanity for anyone to enjoy you. Your music is the least important part mm. of your business. The structure of who you are as a person and what you make, that's what's important. So that mug, that handle, the whole thing has to be right. If you're missing one piece, the whole thing's fucked up. So that's what's, that's what's important. And then you have to get them to wanna press play. Now, once they press play, then your music becomes the most important part of your business and your presentation. Mm -hmm. But to get someone to want to press play, you have to create the intrigue. You have to create the curiosity. You have to be organized and you have to present yourself in a way where even if you're, even if your music sucks, somebody will be like, you know what? This guy's a really, really nice guy. Let me just check this out. You're so polite. I feel bad. And then you do it. Melissa sees it all the time. I feel bad for people all the time. I end up helping them. And they're not that talented, but I'll work with a reasonable person who's not that talented, but they're organized long before I work with someone who's a super talented egomaniac. Yeah. And that's the because I, I got a few, man, I wish I, I could I could talk freely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got some great examples I could give you, but you know, I would end up just smearing the hell out of people. But mm -hmm. they're they're never gonna go anywhere, not because of a lack of talent, but it's a lack of self discipline. So let me sanity. Just let me interject with that, Michael, because the other thing, Dorian, that I noticed too, and this is how, like, when I wrote my book, um, Digitally Independent, and I put it out because questions like what you're asking, Michael and I, like, we'll be in the studio sometimes and he'll ask people, are you BMI? Do you, do you have your bio? Do you have your press kit, your EPK done? You know, the little things. Yeah. They're like, and, or are you with the pro? And they're like, what is that you're talking about yep yep what is you, who's your distributor what's that i just put it on soundcloud that's not putting your song out yep. that's yeah. not, you know where's your website what are your numbers <laughs> you you know, like me. some people only have like i've seen people try to approach me or him 
and they'll only and I'll look up their information. They think I don't look it up, but I do. And they'll have like 12 followers. And yeah. then I'll actually look on the back end and I know how to look up your your, your information um for your music because I have my own label. And I'm like, you don't even have any music. You're nobody's even listening to your stuff. So yeah. how are we gonna promote you? Yeah. How it's that's why that's exactly why I started my company because artists kept asking me like, yo, how'd you get the millions of streams? And how'd you get to deal with uh, journeys? I'm like, well, I have a fucking website. I have a bio. I have a logo. I have a Wikipedia page. I return emails like I can write in coherent sentences, the things y'all don't do. So these are the things that I have to coach on like all the time. So you everything you just said, you literally sound like one of my videos. And it just goes to show like, like Michael said, like Melissa said, you got to have some sort of professionalism where who wants to drag your feet, man. No one wants to get you out of bed and do, I ain't nobody doing that shit. There's too many other people out here who, like Michael said, might not be as talented. But they got a fire in their ass and they're fucking organized and they're going to whoop your ass every single time. Yeah. Every time. Go, go ahead, Michael. You gotta, you gotta think, when you have a when you have like a high school reunion, it's always that nerdy, smart guy that comes back looking great. He's got all the money and the hot wife. It's the, the jock usually looks worn out because his best years are behind him. And that was the guy that led his life with ego. And you don't want to be that guy. You know, it's it's, it's not going to work. And, and the follow-up what Melissa said and what you said, I can't promote your record. If you're like, I, I could promote your record. I could take your money if I was a dick. But I feel bad. When I do yeah. a record promotion campaign for somebody, I want them to see money. I want them to see a return. I get off. My ego gets stroked and they hit me up and they're like, yo, I just got XX amount of dollars in my ass cap. Then I'm like, yeah, motherfucker. Because that's what I want <laughs> to see happen. Yeah. And if you don't have it together, I tell them, look, you're not ready. I'm not going to promote it. I'll tell them what they need to do. If they want to pay me, I'll do it for them. I don't want to. I hate doing that. It's very annoying. But I'll do it. If, if I think the record's really, really big and I think we could run out of time on that kind of record because it might be right with the changes of, of, of the, the music scene, I'll offer to help them with it. But you have to have that together. Otherwise, I can't promote you because I know that I might not be robbing you, but I know that you're robbing yourself. And I can't put myself in a situation where I knowingly allow you to hurt yourself. Yeah, like that's fucked up. Yep, exactly. You know? That's that's the things that, I, that I've been talking about for like two years, man. It's just like you have to once you get the attention, you have to be able to uh, capture like Melissa. I know you probably know about this, but like with a Facebook pixel, the amount of companies that have websites but they don't have a Facebook pixel insulated, but they're running ads. It's like you aren't doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing because you can get, let's say Kylie Jenner shouts your song out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a fucking website, you fucked up. It's done. It's over. Like that's it for yeah, you. you missed it. And these are the things that a lot of artists think they're like, yo, I just need one person to do it. I'm like, yo, you haven't even set up the infrastructure to, to capture that. And then once you start setting up that infrastructure, then you start seeing, like we talked about with Melissa and with Michael is, you start seeing those unconventional ways that you can get in because you see those little gaps and they can take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But people, I think the other two think part of it too, is that I think that they lose sight of no understanding that you are a business, that you are the brand. And if your brand looks shitty, then that's going to be a reflection upon you. If you don't have everything on the back end set up properly, and uh, like all your, like what you see, all your ducks in a row, you know, every little thing, then you're going to, you're going to miss the boat. You're going to miss the boat. And then you're going to have to backtrack on everything. If you do miss the boat, because then you're going to be like, what did I miss wrong? Well, you didn't have an LLC. Well, you didn't, you didn't, you know, sign up with a pro. Well, you didn't, you didn't have a budget. And it's important to have these things, to think about these things, because how you put yourself out there, you want people to know that you're giving quality work. Like for me, it, when I do my music, Michael will tell you, I try, I, I you can play songs that I've had since the 2015 and still so it will still sound good now. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's been, it, it, you know, like it, it's timeless. Yeah. yeah, spent the money on it. You know, you took the time with it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit, sometimes I just throw some shit out there. I don't care. But, <laughs> you know. No, I, I, there's a reason for it. Sometimes I put out something that's kind of shitty sounding with the intent to license it to shitty sounding movies. Like, like B-horror flicks and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's an angle to this. Yeah, yeah. But 
if you're not making something with purpose, then there's no point in making it. Like, yeah. like I, I'm, you know, what she said was right. Do what Melissa did. Don't do what I do. I'm not. <laughs> cool. We we gonna ask this question and then we'll we'll uh, end it there. So to ask the question of the actual episode, so Melissa, how did you actually chart on Billboard? You gotta walk us through that. What song it was, how it happened, who you went through, like how did you actually chart on Billboard? So how my song charted is basically selling records. Um, we basically did a deal with um a distributor and who? um this um. It's through Indie Hitmaker. Um, I don't know if you guys know them, but Indie Hitmaker, the um, the owner of the website, Bram, you guys can look them up, IndieHitmaker.com. They actually help independent artists chart on Billboard. How they do that, they help you do everything from sound scan to you doing your live shows and you actually going to shows and selling your merch and making sure that it's being counted for. And also, we sold a bundle. So for the song that I put out, it wasn't just a single. It was three songs in one. So we sold three songs in one bundle for one price. And it added up. What was what was your marketing? So you went so you went to them, hit them up, and what did they say to you? Did they give you the marketing plan? Did you come up with it? And then what was the steps after that? No, they, they did the marketing plan for us. I didn't have to do much. But what they did was... They basically went through, and this is where I always say to people, you got to have your stuff set up. They checked my website. They checked my SEO in the back end, right? Because they're, they were promoting it. Um, they checked my numbers. They checked everything. And they were like, you need to clean this. You need to do that. Da, da, da. And I went on my website. I cleaned up certain things. I Descriptions on my website. Took off certain pictures on my website. Because they, what they did was they ran an SEO tool that actually... Um, graded my website yeah and and they also did um a search to see how fast my information would come up so people could find me yeah and what people don't know is that when we did that we you know we had a we had a nice budget we spent ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars and our song was on the charts for six weeks oh wow which which chart um it was the hot single sales chart Oh, that's dang bad. That's real yeah. good. And when we first hit it, the first week, we were at number three. Then we stayed at number three two weeks. Then it went to number two. And then within another two weeks, we were at number one. And I was shocked. I was and this, shocked. And and you were constant. So once they set up all once you set up all the all the back end, you were doing the shows and all that. Like, was there anything that you were consistently doing as a part of the campaign, which made the song chart up? Um, I was definitely, you know, telling my fans to, you know, yeah. go check it out. And also the another key thing I, I forgot about this, Michael, is that before it came out, I told people to go ahead and pre buy it. Yes. The, yeah. Michael was waiting for that one. <laughs> I it I can remember it. So, so people are watching. I have my phone facing me, but I don't <laughs> see the screen. It's backwards. So I, I'm going like this because I'm listening. And I'm sitting there going, I remember this. I remember I remember you dropping by and bugging me, going, Hey, did you check it out? Did you check it? I'm like, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the I know I got it. Yes, I got it. yes. Okay. <laughs> and and we and and oddly enough, when we did this, it was um it was more of a like a a childlike song. And parents were picking up the song. Really? For children, yeah. And when we, the music video was done in all in animation. It was a little girl in school, you know, doing her drawing and everything. And who would have thought? And I had a, I had a DJ, one of my good friends, um, remix it. So we had the, the original, the acapella, and a DJ remix. And we sold it as a bundle. That's what's up. Michael, it seems like that you got something to add. Yeah, there. Does. No, you know what it is? I have memories. That's what's going through my head. The, the <laughs> memories. Like like Melissa, Melissa's always hyper, so she sounds actually toned down now. Normally she's like, ah, you know, but um <laughs> it was it was it was funny because when um I don't I don't particularly focus on this the sales charts myself, just because I like the adventure of 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 going crazy and attacking people. But um 
in the long time before, back in like the 2006, seven times like that, I was focused a lot on the sales charts because it was, um, you know, I like the record store aspect of it. And the record yeah. store is moving your product and everything else. And we did the same approach. We had a rock version, an urban version, a dance version. We had a specific radio Disney version just to lock in that station and then get a deal with Epcot. So all the things she's doing, I'm like, mm -hmm, check the list, check the list, check the list. Like she's hitting all those bases. That's the preparation. That's the nerd stuff. That's the organization that needs to be able to, to nail those charts. So as she was explaining it, because we never actually talked about it to each other. <laughs> so as she's explaining i'm like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm like oh now i know okay that's what she did because i had nothing to do with that one yeah so i get jealous when i have nothing to do with that one <laughs> <laughs> don't worry I remember, this one coming she, up you're gonna do she went she came she came to me and i was going through it i'm like well we could do this we could do that we could do this we could do that and then all of a sudden a few weeks later she's like oh I, we went with someone else i'm like motherfucker <laughs> but, uh, you know that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Melissa, I know you got a new single out. Is that what you're working on? And then what else do you have have coming up? Yeah, um, I put out my new song, um, Waterman, which is my production. I produced it. and I Oh, wrote wow. It. Did you? Yeah. Awesome. It sounds good. I liked it. I liked thank it a lot. And I don't like a lot of people's shit, but I liked it. Oh, thank you. Um, Michael Ashby helped me. So he helped me flush it out. So he's the co-producer on it with me. And um, it, it's all me. And so, you know, now I'm just, I'm just pushing it. Like now I, I think I posted today, I got like 600 streams already okay. and it, it just came out on Friday of last week. I mean, that's pretty good, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to talk to you about getting some stuff on some playlists, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um, I'm working on that. So this is my thing. What I'm doing is every, on the 24th day of for the rest of the next, this whole year, Michael knows the whole thing. I'm putting out a song on the 24th day of every month. And at the end of December, it formulates into a whole project. What's the, what's the significance of 24? December, Christmas. It's a present. Th that's Christmas Eve. I, I, yeah. I, I, I know. Okay. So that, oh, so, okay. Oh, at, at midnight. All right. I got it. Yes. I, it, I, it's a I, gift. It's okay. a present. So all the next couple of months on the 24th day, there's going to be a single coming out. Okay. Cool. And it will all formulate. Everything will come together as one big picture and you'll see. Cool. Cool. Michael, how about you? Are you working on anything right now that you want people to know about it? And, and, and where can they find you if they want to get in touch with you? Well, my social media is easy. It's just my name. So just Michael DeBarge at anything. So it's a little at sign and that's it. So it's Twitter, whatever. My email is even that at Gmail. Um, am I working on something? I'm working on more things than I, I can count on my fingers and toes. The quarantine life has been very exciting because uh, I have a lot of downtime. So I'm actually releasing records that are as old as 12 years old. Oh, wow. I'm going back, remixing and shoving them out. So I got one coming out on Friday. I actually am putting out some, some rock covers that I've been sitting on for a few years that are coming out maybe next week. Um, the craziest thing that I'm, I'm really dealing with right now is the stuff of Corey Feldman. So we had this, um, you know, we had the, 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 my truth documentary, which he ousted everybody. And with that, we, um, sorry, I'm not looking at the camera with, okay. with that. We had, uh, a, a, a single, it was the only song that was actually in the movie that played when the credits rolled in it pretty much describes the story of the movie and why he made it. And it's a really kind of avant-garde kind of record. So it's not the thing that you normally see on top 40, but um, because he wanted to, and we have to find ways as independent people in the world with now tons of money, we had to find ways to get people to know about the documentary and get people to pay attention and to get the news to cover it. Mm -hmm. So we used billboard and radio promotion as a way to get, you know, press because Corey Feldman on the billboard charts is not a common thing and it's kind of almost weird. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's everyone thinks of him as that, oh, the kid from the Goonies is an actor. So to get him in a whole nother place is all something that we're doing to bring attention to this documentary and, and to- Like a conversation uh, piece, right? Yeah, we're trying to get people to go, what? And this way they're gonna go, why is it? And they listen to the song and they're like, man, this is a really morbid topic. And then 
they start to realize, oh, we're, we're trying to change the laws here. And mm -hmm. we're raising the statute of limitations against child abuse. And then we've been able to do it in California and several other places. So there's a real mission and objective. But um, it's the kind of subject that people don't want to talk about because it's a it's a, a kind of dark and, and, you know, just depressing kind of thing. So right now he's, um, he was, uh, I, I don't even want to say the wrong thing. I think he was number three on Billboard's Most Added this week. And then I have him... Um, Right now, today, he debuted on Billboard at, at number uh, 20 with a Billboard That's song. crazy, Michael. Yeah, yeah. And it's not an adult <laughs> content. Had to think outside the box to, to make this work because it wasn't like a traditional rock song. And uh, it's a soundtrack record, you know? And I'm proud of it. It's it's hogging a ton of my time and it's stressing me out. And, and the way that we're doing it, kind of to answer the question from before, but how are you getting it on Billboard? Just to give people a different perspective of how I... Uh, the difference between a sales chart and a and an airplane chart is uh for many many years i would drive up and down the coast and there was a time for the last three years where i had moved to north carolina because i would be only three blocks away from the beasley station which controls a lot of the southern radio stations it's like the main like the mainframe and those stations are more affordable for people so I would get in and physically go meet everybody as if it was the 1960s. And I would drive to Michigan, I'd drive to Florida and I would drop the records off in person. I did that for many years. And that's where I got the connections to be able to go. So when you know, I reach out to someone, they know what I'm talking about, they know what the timing is. And uh, it's the old fashioned way of promoting a record, just getting out there and hustling and harassing people. Now I can email people and now I can call them, you know, sometimes if I really need someone's attention, I'm sending Chinese food and having the guy write a message to, to call Michael DeBarge. And uh, I can make sure that the, the record gets into the right hands. But that's a, it's a really stressful, old fashioned way of doing it. Oh, wait, one more, Michael. Um, Dorian, DJ pools. That's the other thing that helped. That, oh. that still was a thing. DJ yeah. pools. Really? Yes. Yeah, they, they made so them more stuff is still going on. <laughs> yeah, they made that stuff more private, but they do do it. Yeah, they a lot well, of the you can they, from there too. Yeah, it's not it's not as easy. You still have to like hustle and bother people, but when you're in the DJ pool, they have access to it. And you gotta remember, sometimes you just need the rest of the station to try you out. So sometimes in the middle of the night, if they got to reach their quota for the government to say, yeah, we played five to 15% of our airtime, it might be the middle of the night, but they will find stuff in the DJ pools. And if there's something that's cool, they might use it as a segue. Like, let's say they play your song for 30 seconds um, while they're right before a commercial, while someone's making an announcement, they'll have like the instrumental playing and they can get away with that. Mm -hmm. So they dig some of that stuff up from the DJ pool. So, yeah, How do you get into DJ pools? Um, there's one called um digital dj pool.com mm -hmm. and then there's starfleet which has been around for like many 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 years and the guy's name um his name is ronnie matthews i said it um tell him if anybody finds him tell him melissa b sent you <laughs> right here, here's a here's an ironic segue the guy that invented the digital record pool his name is michael matthews He's a very good friend of mine. And his first client was my father. And uh, so my tie with him goes all the way back to that because that was the first person to ever put him on. So when I need to get into a record pool, I just call the guy that owns the copyrights on all the record pools. There you go. He, Damn. So sometimes it's your grandfather <laughs> connections that makes it work. Yeah. And those Matthew boys. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's how you can you can do it. Cool, cool. Well, I appreciate you both coming on. Um, this was mad informative. I know a lot of people are gonna get a lot of value out of out of this. You both have done great things. Um, if you ever need anything from me, I know this is the first time meeting like in person. Michael, you're meeting me via audio. But <laughs> if you need some help with, with Wait, anything. You, me? you say what? You can't see me? No, he oh, can, see, can see you. I don't think you can see us. Oh no, no. I, I mean I'm gonna go look at this whenever it gets posted or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But um, if you guys need help with anything like our company, like I said, we do stuff with Facebook ads and Instagram ads and the websites and just anything you need help with anything. Just let me know, because now once you come into the pond, like you're a part of it forever. So yeah. and I want everybody to go follow them on social media. Go support the new single. Go support Corey's single. Go actually. I don't know if Michael wants you to watch the documentary. I don't know if he gets anything off of that. But you do need to read about Corey Feldman. You, and what you should watch the documentary just because. Yes. 
it should be known. You know, it's it's and it's very well done. I, I don't to me, I don't need to get anything off of something to be involved or invested in it. I mean, I get nothing from Melissa's Waterman record, but I'm gonna still get out there and post it and do that because you want to make sure everybody's everybody's moving. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm good. Like as long as I'm I'm busy, clients are coming in, man, just go check out the documentary, you know, support it, you know, understand it. You know, because it's it's dark. Did you see it or you know about it? Nah, I I have a hard time watching stuff about that, man. I, rape and molestation stuff. That stuff is really difficult for me to watch. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's talking it's about it for him. That was very, very, very hard. And it needs to it needs to be a topic of conversation. Like, like I mean, I'm gonna just say this and we can go on. But yeah. like, I can empathize with with anybody, even people that like commit crimes. Like, I can empathize why you sell drugs or if you might kill somebody. But if you're a child molester or like a rapist, man, I I can't. That shit just it I can't I can't do it. I can't do it. It just makes me so fucking so I haven't watched it, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well you should you should you should do a little research on it because it's gonna change the way you watch TV, possibly. Yeah, it is man. Yeah. Fucked up shit in Hollywood, but <laughs> so that's that was a yes. yeah, what if it's down, you know? It's just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I appreciate that all y'all coming in and yes. Thank you for this. We're out the pond. Y'all stay true. All right.